Welcome to mini lesson five. What we're going to do now is apply our formula for relating Helmholtz potential and partition function to specifically the ideal gas. So we'll be able to get all the thermodynamics of the ideal gas from the partition function. This is going back to section uh, chapter six, section seven of Schroeder. So we want to combine the two big results from the last two mini lessons. So two times ago we derived that the partition function, the composite partition function for the ideal gas was this expression. So this is the quantum concentration, it depends on temperature, volume, and here's the particle number n. And we want to just sub that in to this expression from the very most recent mini lesson f is equal to minus kbt ln z sub n. So let's just sub in. You've got this expression, and you can start messing around inside the argument of the logarithm. Pull down the power of n, that gives you an n out here, and then separate out the denominator with a minus sign. You see a natural log of n factorial, you know you're going to be doing Stirling's approximation. In this class we call it baby Stirling. Uh, just ln n factorial is approximately equal to n ln n minus n. Um, how do we know that's justified here? Um, there are a lot of opportunities where if n is not a large enough number, everything that we've done in the course of deriving all these expressions breaks down. So when we're dealing with statistical mechanics, we're almost always going to be in a position to mix Stirling's approximation. So we apply it and we get f equals minus kbt n ln n q v minus n ln n plus n. Don't forget to distribute that minus sign through Stirling's approximation. And so now we're just going to collect uh, logarithmic terms and divide back through by n. We're left with an n here that we can factor out. And we'll just note that v over n is 1 over the actual concentration of the gas. So our final expression for the Helmholtz potential of the ideal monatomic gas, I should say, this partition function was for monatomic gases, is minus n kbt natural log quantum concentration divided by actual concentration plus 1. All right, very good. Let's make a couple of remarks. Number one, Helmholtz potential needs to be extensive. And so what we've got here is a product of two factors. This prefactor out front of the square bracket is extensive because it has a proportionality factor of n. Inside of here, we have only intensive quantities. So this is a particle density and the quantum, oops, sorry. Quantum concentration depends only on temperature and other intensive quantities. So for example, the mass in the quantum concentration is the mass of an individual constituent. That does not scale with system size. So the square brackets are fully intensive. So an extensive times an intensive is gonna be extensive. And so that checks out, that's good. Another thing that we should remark upon is like the, the general appearance of this equation sort of reminds us of the soccer tetrode equation which we derived for entropy as a function of u, v, and n back in chapter two. So we can actually re-derive it using what we've got now, uh, but just applying entropy is equal to negative partial f partial t at constant v and n. So what we want to do first is convert f into its yuckiest possible appearance by using the full form of n sub q and little n. So this is little n factored out and this whole thing is n sub q. So now we've got some function that is explicitly a function of n, t, and v and nothing else, no other macroscopic variables appear in that formula. 
That's really important, right? Because using this expression requires us to be respectful of the macroscopic independent variables, t, v, and n. If we had a function that included another macroscopic variable in it, applying this equation would give us a wrong answer. That's one of the things that you're really supposed to be learning from this part of the class that's kind of a subtle lesson, um, but very important for accurately applying thermodynamic formalism. All right, so let's actually just do the derivative now. Here we go. So this is our ugly form of f, and we're going to take this partial, as we said on the last slide. So another tool that I think you should probably have seen before in this class and that you should probably get used to using is that when we're taking partials um, of a function that involves a logarithm like this with a lot of ugly stuff, it's usually really convenient to try to um, simplify the way you write this expression so that you don't make math errors basically based on neatness, right? So we're going to take a partial with respect to t. The only thing we need to keep visible to our calculus eyes is the, the t function, t to the 3 halves. Everything else inside the logarithm is a constant, so I'm going to call it capital C. That stands for constant. It would depend on what you were doing, right? If you were taking a partial with respect to v, then v would be the thing you would leave out, and um, the rest of it would be a constant, okay? <clears throat> so let's work with this formula. Again, it's, it's mainly for convenience uh, and just not having to write things down and get, our, get ourselves confused as we take the derivative. So we're just going to do a product rule. We're going to go, this is a, <clears throat> a function of temperature here times another function of temperature here. So let's use the product rule. So we go the second function times the derivative of the first gives us minus nkb times all that square bracket plus the first function times the derivative of the second. And so inside these square brackets, I've taken the derivative of all this stuff in here with respect to temperature. And so that just gives me 1 over the argument of the logarithm times the first derivative of the stuff in the logarithm, which is 3 halves c t to the 1 half. And so now we just keep going. Uh, a couple of nice things happen. The first term basically stays the same. The second term, you get a cancellation of c's, and the t becomes just a 1 over t. And you can see that's going to cancel the t out here. By the way, you almost knew that had to happen based on units, right? Entropy has to have units that are the same as kb. And so if you're multiplying through by a t, you have a unit problem, and that better go away. All right, so keep going. Um, cancel the t's like we said. We've got minus nkb ln of all this plus 1 minus 3 halves nkb. And let's collect the terms that are all multiplied by n. So we get minus nkb natural log of this stuff plus 5 halves. That's a 5 halves that should look familiar to you. And so this is an expression that is exactly soccer tetrode. We just have to remember that up at the tippy top, we define c t to the 3 halves to already be n sub q over n. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a re-derivation of soccer tetrode from Helmholtz free energy. You can also derive PV equals NKBT from F equals minus KBT ln Z sub N. You should do this example by yourself, show that it's true. You can also do examples where you would calculate C sub V, C sub P, kappa sub T. These are the response functions. They have simple partial derivative relationships connecting them to F that you can do all by yourself. This is easy fodder for test questions where it should be a couple of line derivation that shows me how well you're able to work within this formalism that we've been doing in chapter five and connecting now to an idea in chapter six. So let's do one more thing. What if we wanted to get another thermodynamic potential? I mean, I have an interesting comment to make about this and that I would like to say that F, the Helmholtz potential, 
is a pretty common potential to arise as an output of a theoretical calculation. Very often in a theoretical calculation, you set up a system to have a fixed particle number, fixed volume, fixed temperature, right? So those are your independent variables. Uh, and then you'll do some calculations and get some results and you'll probably end up with a prediction for what is the potential F. By contrast, if you're in a lab doing an experiment, F is less accessible because very often you're doing your experiments under conditions of constant T, P, and N, right? So temperature, pressure, and particle number. And so very often to make a connection between a theoretical prediction from a collaborator, say, and an experiment that you could do in your lab if you're an experimentalist, you'll need to take an F from theory and convert it into G. So let's see how to do this. Number one, by inspection again of the differential of G, we expect it to be a function of T, P, and N. And so it's really important here not to just be sort of glib about just add a PV onto F. I mean, technically that's true, but it gives you an answer that is not usable as the thermodynamic potential G, right? So here I just take F from before, add on PV, and the problem is that is not a function of T, P, and N. And so if I would actually try to use partial derivative relationships, Maxwell relations, you in the context of this function, they would be wrong. Instead, I have to make sure that in the end, my function has the right independent variables. So what I can do is substitute PV equals NKVT and the related expression V over N equals KVT over P. I'll put that over here. I can sub both of those in. It turns out that the NKVTs are gonna cancel. PV cancels with negative NKVT here. And we're just left with G is equal to negative NKBT natural log KBT over P times the quantum concentration. So this does indeed have the correct independent variables of only T, P, and N to be a good Gibbs potential for which all the known partial relations and Maxwell relations are valid. Um, another thing that I want to point out here, because sometimes I think it's it's easy to get confused about sort of logical content. PV equals NKBT, we can derive already from the known form of F. So in the analysis that we've done in these slides, substituting this in here is not an empirical input. We know empirically that PV equals NKBT is often true, but in this context, it's actually a theoretical result that falls out from the statistical mechanics that we've already done for the monatomic ideal gas. Um, all right, so that's pretty much all I want to say uh, the uh, about this topic. So the next lesson is going to be talking about how do we extend partition functions and thermodynamics in the canonical ensemble when we have internal degrees of freedom. So we'll see you next time.